The Ultimate Safari by Nadine Gordimer. <clears throat> the African adventure lives on. You can do it. The Ultimate Safari or Expedition with Leaders Who Know Africa. Travel advertisement from the Observer in London, November 27th, 1988. That night our mother went to the shop and she didn't come back, ever. What happened? I don't know. My father had also gone away one day and never come back, but he was fighting in the war. We were in the war too, but we were children. We were like our grandmother and grandfather. We didn't have guns. The people my father was fighting, the bandits, they're called by our government, ran all over the place and we ran away from them like chickens chased by dogs. We didn't know where to go. Our mother went to the shop because someone said you could get some oil for cooking. We're happy because we hadn't had tasted oil for a long time. Perhaps she got the oil and someone knocked her down in the dark and took the oil from her. Perhaps she met the bandits. If you meet them, they will kill you. Twice they came to our village and we ran and hid in the bush. And when they'd gone, we came back and found they had taken everything. But the third time they came back, there was nothing to take. No oil, no food. So they burned the thatch and the roofs of our houses fell in. So my mother found some pieces of tin and we put those all up over part of the house. We were waiting there for her that night. She never came back. We were frightened to go out, even to do our business, because the bandits did come. Not into our house. Without a roof, it must have looked as if there was no one in it, everything gone. But all through the village, we heard people screaming and running. We were afraid even to run, without our mother to tell us where. I'm the middle one, the girl, and my little brother clung against my stomach with his arms round my neck and his legs round my waist like a baby monkey to its mother. All night, my firstborn brother kept in his hand a broken piece of wood from one of our burnt house poles. It was to save himself if the bandits found him. We stayed there all day, waiting for her. I don't know what day it was. There was no school, no church anymore in our village, so you didn't know whether it was a Sunday or Monday. When the sun was going down, our grandmother and grandfather came. Someone from our village had told them that we children were alone. Our mother had not come back. I say grandmother before grandfather because it's like that our grandmother is big and strong not yet old and our grandfather is small you don't know where he is in his loose trousers he smiles but he hasn't heard what you're saying and his hair looks like it's left full of soap suds our grandmother took us me the baby my firstborn brother our grandfather back to her house and we were all afraid except the baby asleep on our grandmother's back of meeting the bandits on the way we waited a long time at our grandmother's place. Perhaps it was a month. We were hungry. Our mother never came. While we were waiting for her to fetch us, our grandmother had no food for us, no food for our grandfather and herself. A woman with milk in her breasts gave some for my little brother, although at our house he used to eat porridge, same as we did. Our grandmother took us to look for wild spinach, but everyone else in her village did the same, and there wasn't a leaf left. Our grandfather, walking a little behind some young men, went to look for our mother, but didn't find her. Our grandmother cried with the other women, and I sang the hymns with them. They brought a little food, some beans, but after two days, there was nothing again. Our grandfather used to have three sheep and a cow in a vegetable garden, but the bandits had long ago taken the sheep and the cow because they were hungry too. And when planting time came, our grandfather had no seed to plant. So they decided grandmother did. Our grandfather made little noises and rocked from side to side, but she took no notice. We would go away. We children were pleased. We wanted to go away from where our mother wasn't and where we were hungry. We wanted to go where there were no bandits and there was food. We were glad to think there must be such a place away. Our grandmother gave her church clothes to someone in exchange for some dried mealies and she boiled them and tied them in a rag. We took them with us when we went, and she thought we would get water from the rivers, but we didn't come to any river, so we got so thirsty we had to turn back. Not all the way to our grandparents' place, but to a village where there was a pump. She opened the basket where she carried some clothes and mealies after she told, sold her shoes to buy a big plastic container for water. I said, Gogo, how will you go to church now, even without shoes? But she said we had a long journey and too much to carry. At the village, we met other people who were also going away. We joined them because they seemed to know where that was better than we did. To get there, we had to go through the Kruger Park. 
we knew about the Kruger Park. A kind whole country of animals. Elephants, lions, jackals, hyenas, hippos, crocodiles, all kinds of animals. We had some of them in our own country before the war, our grandfather remembers. We children weren't born yet. But the bandits kill the elephants and sell their tusks. And the bandits and our soldiers have eaten all the buck. There was a man in our village without legs. A crocodile took them off in our river. But all the same, our country is a country full of people, not animals. We knew about the Kruger Park because some of our men used to leave home to work there in the places where white people came to stay and look at the animals. So we started to go away again. There were women and other children like me who had to carry the small ones on their backs when the women got tired. A man led us into Kruger Park. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I kept asking her grandmother. Not yet, the man said when she asked him for me. He told us we had to take a long way to get around the fence, which he explained would kill you. Roast off your skin the moment you touched it, like the wires high up on poles that give electric lights in our towns. I've seen that sign of a head without eyes or skin or hair on an iron box at the Mission Hospital we used to have before it was blown up. When I asked the next time, they said we'd be walking in the Kruger Park for an hour. But it looked just like a bush we'd been walking through all day. And we hadn't seen any animals except the monkeys and birds which live around us at home. And a tortoise that, of course, couldn't get away from us. My first-born brother and the other boys brought it to the man so it could be killed and we could cook and eat it. He let it go because he told us we could not make a fire. All the time we were in the park, we must not make a fire because the smoke would show we were there. Police, wardens would come and send us back to where we came from. He said we must move like animals among the animals, away from the roads, away from the white people's camps. And at that moment I heard, I'm sure I was the first to hear, cracking branches and the sound of something parting grasses. And I almost squealed because I thought it was the police, wardens, the people he was telling us to look out for, what found us already. And it was an elephant and another elephant and more elephants, big blots of dark moved wherever you could be between the trees. They were curling their trunks around the red leaves of the mopen trees and stuffing them into their mouths. The babies leaned against their mothers. The almost grown up ones wrestled like my firstborn brother with his friends, only now they used trunks instead of arms. I was so interested, I forgot to be afraid. The man said we should just stand still and be quiet while the elephants passed. They passed very slowly because elephants are too big to need to run from anybody. The buck ran from us. They jumped so high they seemed to fly. Warthogs stopped dead. Then they heard us, and they swerved off the way in a boy the way a boy in our village used to zigzag on the bicycle with his father had brought back from the mines. We followed the animals to where they drank. When they had gone, we went to their water holes. We were never thirsty without finding water. But animals ate all ate all the time. Whenever you saw them, they were eating grass, trees, roots. There was nothing for us. The mealies were finished. The only food we could eat was what the baboons ate. Dry little figs full of ants that grow along the branches of the trees in the rivers. It was hard to be like the animals. When it was very hot during the day, we would find lions lying asleep. They were the color of grass, and we didn't see them at first, but the man did, and he led us back a long way around where they slept. I wanted to lie down like the lions. My little brother was getting thin, but he was very heavy. When our grandmother looked for me to put him on my back, I tried not to see. My firstborn brother stopped talking. When we rested, he had to be shaken to get up again, as if he were just like our grandfather he couldn't hear. I saw flies crawling on our grandmother's face, and she didn't brush them off. I was frightened. I picked up a palm leaf and chased them. We walked at night as well as by day. We could see the fires where the white people were cooking in the camps, and we could smell the smoke and the meat. We watch the hyenas in their backs that slope as if they're ashamed, slipping through the bush after the smell. If one turned its head, you saw it had big brown shining eyes like our own, and when we looked at each other in the dark, the wind brought voices in our own language from the compounds where the people who worked in the camp live. A woman among us wanted to go to them at night and ask them to help us. They can give us food from the dustbins, she said. She started wailing, and our grandmother had to grab her and put a hand over her mouth. The man who led us told us we must keep out of the way of the people who worked at Kruger Park. If they helped us, they would lose their work. And if they saw us, all they could do was pretend we were not there, that they had seen only animals. Sometimes when we stopped to sleep for a little while at night, we slept close together. I don't know which night it was because we were walking, walking, any time, all the time. We heard lions very near. 
not groaning loudly the way they did far off, panting like we do when we run, but it's a different kind of panting. You hear they're not running, they're, they're waiting somewhere near. We all rolled closer together on top of each other, the ones on the edge fighting to get into the middle. I was squashed against a woman who smelled bad because she was afraid, but I was glad to hold tight to her. I prayed to God to make the lions take someone on the edge and go. I shut my eyes not to see the tree from which the lion might jump right in the middle of us, where I was. The man who led us jumped instead and beat the tree with a dead branch. He had taught us never to make a sound, but he shouted. He shouted at the lions like a drunk man shouting at nobody in our village. The lions went away. We heard them groaning, shouting back at him from far off. We were tired, so tired. My firstborn brother and the man had to lift our grandfather from stone to stone where we found our places to cross the rivers. Our grandmother is strong, but her feet were bleeding. We could not carry the basket on our heads any longer. We couldn't carry anything except my little brother. We left our things under a bush. As long as our bodies got there, our grandmother said. Then we ate some wild fruit and didn't know from home and stomachs ran. We were in the grass called elephant grass because it was nearly as tall as an elephant. That day we had those pains and our grandfather couldn't get down in front of people like my little brother. He went off into the grass to be on his own. We had to keep up. The man who led us always telling us we must catch up, but we asked him to wait for our grandfather. So everyone waited for our grandfather to catch up, but he didn't. It was the middle of the day. Insects were singing in our ears and we couldn't hear him moving through the grass. We couldn't see him because the grass was so high and he was so small. But he must have been somewhere there inside his loose trousers and his shirt that was torn and our grandmother couldn't sew because she had no cotton. We knew he couldn't have gone far because he was weak and slow. We all went to look for him, but in groups, so we too wouldn't be hidden from each other in that grass. It got into our eyes and noses. We called him softly, but the noise of the insects must have filled the little space left for hearing in his ears. We looked and looked, but we couldn't find him. We stayed in that long grass all night. In my sleep, I found him curled round a place he had trampled down for himself, like the places we'd seen where the buck hide for their babies. When I woke up, he still wasn't anywhere. So we looked again, and by now there were paths we made going through the grass many times. It would be easy for him to find us if he could, we couldn't find him. All that day we just sat and waited. Everything's very quiet when the sun is on your head, inside your head, even if you lie, like the animals under the trees. I lay on my back and saw those ugly birds with hooked beaks and plucked necks flying round and round above us. We had passed them often when they were feeding on the bones of dead animals. Nothing was ever left there for us to eat. Round and round, high up, and then lower down, and then high again. I saw their necks poking to this side and that, flying round and round. I saw our grandmother, who sat up all the time with my little brother on her lap, was seeing them too. In the afternoon, the man who led us came to our grandmother and told her that other people must move on. He said, if their children don't eat soon, they will die. Our grandmother said nothing. I'll bring you water before we go, he told her. Our grandmother looked at us, me, my firstborn brother, and my little brother on her lap. We watched the other people getting up to leave. I didn't believe the grass would be empty all around us where they had been, that we would be alone in this place, the Kruger Park. The police or the animals would find us. Tears came out of my eyes and nose onto my hands, but our grandmother took no notice. She got up with her feet apart the way she puts them when she's about to light fire, lift firewood at home in our village. She swung my little brother onto her back, tried him in her cloth, the top of her dress was torn and her big breasts were showing, but there was nothing in them for her. She said, come. We left the place with the long grass, left behind. We went with the others and the man who led us. We started to go away again.